Yes. <laughs> Yo, Estoqua, Ethan Robinson Nuba. Uh, it is always a pleasure and a delight to be here on the territory of the Tsleil-Waututh, the Squamish, and the Musqueam. Uh, your lands are beautiful. Uh, thank you so much for the ability to, you know, for us to be here and to gather on it. Uh, my dad is Heisla. My mom is Halsek. I grew up in my dad's reserve of Kitimat Village. Uh, it's 500 miles north, which sounds like it should be the, the furthest north you can go, but it's actually not. It's about halfway up the province. So where the Alaska Panhandle comes down into BC, at the bottom of it, uh, our reserve is about an hour's drive away from there. Uh, uh, technically, both of my uh, both of my families come from matrilineal cultures, so uh, I should be Eagle Clan because my mom is Eagle Clan. But my dad, uh, my dad's family, uh, adopted me and my sister into the two beavers sharing at the Tree of Life when I was ten years old. Uh, so I grew up in the Heisla culture, and um, there are about 500 First Nations on Turtle Island or North America. Uh, 60 of those uh, live in BC, in BC, and from Alaska down to Washington, 30 of those nations are Palachi nations. Uh, the big division between the 30 nations are uh, the, the nations that potlatch in the northern style and the potlatch and you know from around the Vancouver area especially around Vancouver Island uh, they potlatch in the southern style <laughs> uh, and uh, people find it confusing when they come to BC because if you're from Ontario like there's only a, a few different nations to remember but here, uh, we love complexity. We love the gray areas. So there's, like for instance, the Shikwema have like 17 different reserves. Uh, and they have like one overarching, like organizing, like band system. Uh, the Haisla aren't that complicated. We only have three. Uh, and we've all amalgamated onto one reserve. But, uh, I've written uh, like a book that was set in Kitimat called Monkey Beach, and <laughs> oh, that was, it came out 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> I'm still going to look at that, um, and uh, my most recent book, uh, I've been writing a trickster trilogy, and our trickster is Weekend. And uh, we get is the transforming raven. And I have always thought of writers as tricksters. But when I was talking to my aunties, I began to see that, no, we're actually more like Duhaba. So uh, when you're talking about like soothsayers and oracles, the Duhaba uh, were more of our, the Heisla astronomers. So. Uh, the, the main reserve where I live is Samotsa, and it, it, that means uh, Snag Beach. Uh, <laughs> uh, in in power culture, to snag is to hook up. Uh, so I always thought that would be an amazing name for like a an indigenous soap opera. <laughs> is on the west side of this uh, fjord. It, it goes inland 70 miles. It's a deep sea channel. And uh, it's, uh, it's framed by granite mountains with the glaciated rounded tops. Uh, so it's granite mountains, and then it's the ocean. And Smotza is like on a, a kind of alluvial flat. So. Uh, when we have tsunami warnings, we're like half a foot above sea level. <laughs> 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 well, I don't know why I find that funny. <laughs> <laughs> I have kind of a dark sense of humor. Um, but, the, but 
that the whole, uh, you know, there are six mountains on the other side of the channel that form the Heisley calendar. Uh, if you look south down the channel, there's a, there's a large triangular shaped mountain called Kavisla, which is the mountain in the center. And just to the east of it is um, the, the first mountain in the, in the calendar. It's Chundish. And Chundish uh, has a, just a beautiful, like, sort of ice cream shaped top. And there's like a, a triangle. Uh, and it's dark, and that is, it used to be a shaman's cave, and above it is a, a very old tree. So, on the winter solstice, uh, if the sun sets on this side of the tree, that means that the spring is going to be uh, very late, cold and rainy, and if it sets on that side of the tree, it's going to be like a long, lush, early, warm spring. Um, if it sets on the tree, it's going to be normal. So, uh, so the people in charge of watching where the sun would set were the Dukhala, which is literally the, the watchers of the setting sun. And um, each clan had their own Dukhala. And at sunset, they would all gather on the beach in front of the, the calendar rock. So the calendar rock was uh, like a one-ton piece of granite with petroglyphs on the top. And the most important petroglyph was the sun face. And each of the rays pointed to a different part of the, of the Heisley calendar. So from the winter solstice, um, there, there were a couple of important points, but the most important point of all was the, the Jachwin canoe. Uh, the Jachum Yowa. Um, so when the sun set on the bow of the Ulican canoe, that meant we had to break winter camp and go out to our Ulican camps. And each clan had their own, their own Wawe, their own place where they uh, set up camp to get Ulicans. And um, you know, because they were, because they were, the Dufala were all from different clans. When they would gather there uh, at sunset, they would argue. And my great my great grandfather was a Duhala, and he was uh, he built the first general store, and he um, he he built it near the calendar rock, and he put a window in the back, so in the winter they wouldn't have to go outside. <laughs> and my dad remembers listening to them argue. Um, and that was just one of my uh, favorite stories that he would tell me of them. Uh, and when I think of my role as a writer, I used to tell people that, you know, writers are tricksters. But, um, you know, I think, I think we're more like trying to place a novelist into our world. Uh, it is difficult because we we weaponized our stories. Um, you, uh, the all of the Polynesian cultures are hierarchical, so you were you're born into your status. Uh, for instance, my name is it's a good name, uh, it's, but it's not you know that good. <laughs> I think Fergie <laughs> rather than Diana. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, um, if my cousins who have the big names, the noble names, uh, they come with a lot of, uh, a lot of rights, uh, but they also come with a lot of responsibilities. Uh, and I, I'm very happy to have, a, you know, not such a big name because I'm a horrible event planner. <laughs> um, and if you've ever held a college, it's, it's like a mix of a very large wedding and a very large conference, uh, but with clan politics mixed down. So I just, you know, um, so if I wanted, okay, I have to step back a bit. Um, so in the way that we proved our rank was with our stories, our songs, and our dances. So 
when you hear people talking about potlatches, it wasn't just a big feast. Um, it was, it was a, a, a legal event. It was a spiritual event. It was a cultural event. It was all of those things mixed into like one long sort of, uh, you know, wedding slash conference. So it would be uh, some, the potlatches for the big names would last for a week. Uh, so <laughs> you, you could stay in the longhouse for, uh, you know, 24 hours at a time. Um, and all of those songs and dances and stories that were told at the potlatch, uh, those stories proved the rank or the status of the people that were throwing the potlatch. And they belonged to those people. So uh, if I wanted to tell one of those stories, uh, I would have to pay high slow copyright, which is a feast. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I don't have the rank to throw a potlatch, um, so I would have to attach my potlatch business to someone else's potlatch, which is you know, a, a level of diplomacy that I, I, I'm nowhere near. And so I t those are the those are the, what I consider the formal oral stories. Like they have a very specific purpose. They have a very um, you know they are a part of our most sacred culture. Uh, so when I'm writing fiction, I don't go <laughs> anywhere near those. <laughs> I tend to stick with the informal stories. And those stories are the stories like the trickster stories. Uh, these are the stories that we would usually tell kids, like to teach them our nuyum, our, our handsome way of living. Uh, this is what good people do. And we get uh, taught us this by breaking all the rules. And when I was growing up, after dinner, uh, we'd all gather at the table and I come from a family of storytellers, and they would tell trickster stories all night, and they would get uh, they would get really competitive because we didn't really fight. Uh, we fought with stories and songs and dances, so it was very competitive. And they would the stories would get wilder and funnier and faster, and uh, it was just so much fun. Uh, so when my, when my dad was trying to tell my niece and nephew uh, trickster stories, he was, he was giving them some of his funniest stories, but they'd grown up in Ontario, so they, they didn't understand the context. And I found that really sad, so I decided to write a short story telling uh, my version of a trickster story. And uh, it turned into three novels. <laughs> so I had a lot more to say than I thought. Um, but it led to some interesting conversations at home. Um, like when I was at the Elder Center, uh, when you know, they were debating the role of literature in, in oral culture. Uh, and they were doing it in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and there was like a, there was a, a totem pole that was put up, and the artist did it in a southern style. So the the big difference between northern and southern totem poles is that southern totem poles are completely painted, and northern totem poles are usually quite bare, uh, with usually just black or red. But he'd done his entire pole a, a kind of sort of buttery yellow. And then you know, did, you know, he was he was playing with color, uh, and one of the elders who was defending me was saying, you know, it's like that totem pole. <laughs> it's kind of bizarre, <laughs> but you get used to it. <laughs> uh, so I was, you know, kind of, you know, happy that she was coming to my defense, but. Uh, but I think 
you know, the way the novels tell stories is very different from the way that my community tells stories. And um, I, so I don't think the trickster analogy for writers would be accurate. I think of myself more as a duhala. Like the, the trickster is a, a singular character. Um, there he's he's you know he's a bragger. He's a little selfish. You know the things that he does that are good. He does mostly by accident. Um, and he's you know he's very uh, alone. And when I think of a writer, you know we are creating. But I think of myself as someone who's looking at events and interpreting them. But it's not a but it's not a singular interpretation. I have a, a community of writers who are trying to do the same thing. Um, and you, oh, oh, that was really fast. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that was so that was where I came to, and when I was telling that to the elders, they were uh, very amused, and they said, "Well, your interpretations are, you know, uh, very interesting." <laughs> Thank you so much.